Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about airway disease. So we, we two different types of airway disease. We have obstructive disease and we have restrictive disease. Now restrictive disease and obstructive diseases come under either asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, and cystic fibrosis, with restrictive disease comprising of pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, heart failure, and obesity. In obstructive disease, the pathology is that there is decreased airflow into the lungs. The air is stuck, and it's not being able to reach the terminal bronchioles and thus the alveoli. In restrictive disease, however, we have decreased lung volume, which results in a stiffer lung. And what this presents as is in this graph. So this is a spirometry graph. Our normal volume is projected here. This is a normal, healthy lung. What happens here is we have the peak expiratory volume in one second. So this is in the first second, all the volume you expire when you do a forceful expiration. Now in obstructive disease, we have a low FEV one, similar in restrictive disease. And as you can see, we reach a final FVC that is similar to the normal lung. This is because the air eventually gets into the lungs, it's just not as efficient, and the difficulty remains that in the first second of expiration, it's much lower, so it's less efficient. This gives us an FEV1 to FVC ratio of 0.7, or less. When we look at restrictive disease, we see that the FVC is also decreased, and this is because the lung volume is much, much smaller. So the final volume that we reach is going to be lower. Now, since both the FEV1 and the FVC are decreased, we might have an FEV1 to FVC ratio which remains the same, and therefore might be greater than 0.7. Comparison to obstructive disease, where we don't have this. So the first, we're going to talk about asthma. So asthma is a pathophysiology where we have a triad of inflammation, narrowing, causing hypertrophy and hypermucosemia. In a normal airway, we have a nice clear lumen and relaxed smooth muscles. In asthma, we have thickening of the walls and inflammation of the mucus. We also have high mucus secreted by goblet cells. The inflammation is mediated through a type 1 hypersensitivity. What this means is that it's usually IgE mediated, responding to an allergen. When this happens, the walls become inflamed and thickened. Um, this is due to the inflammation present, which causes the smooth muscles to tighten. And we also get narrowing as a result of um, increased hypertrophy and remodeling within the tissue. We also have more secretions, which gives the, of the characteristic wheeze. And during an asthmatic attack, which is an acute asthma, all of this just becomes much more exacerbated and much worse. When we look at symptoms, we can see we have breathlessness, we have wheezing, we have coughing. Now the wheezing comes from the increased mucus, and that's what causes the wheezing sound. Breathlessness comes from the decreased um, lumen volume, which means less air reaches uh, terminal bronchioles, and the coughing is due to the irritation caused by the inflammation and the excess mucus. The tightness in the chest may also be experienced, which is a culmination of all these symptoms together. In terms of history, we'll have eczema, this is atopy. We might have nasal polyps, which further make the breathing much more difficult, and also chronic sinusitis. And this is sort of pathognomic in asthma, where we have this history of atopy, which can contribute um, to asthma development. There's multiple causes of asthma. Um, most of them are environmental, as we can see. Um, we have stuff like mold, dust mites, and pets. So this could be pet hair, this could be mold within a building, and dust mites um, within the house. And some patients might require special uh, circumstances and special equipment for their beds and special preparations to get rid of the dust mites. 
certain fragrances may trigger allergens. I mean, certain people might be allergic to um, certain smells. And then we have occupational risks, so cleaning chemicals. So if a patient has improvement in their symptoms when they're at home, when they're not working, this could be someone like a cleaner, um, then that might indicate it's an occupational asthma. We also have, of course, smoking cigarette smoke. And that's why we recommend to patients to stop smoking to ease with their symptoms. Next thing we have is the monitoring and the different investigations. So what we have is a peak expiratory flow where the patient has to stand up, take a deep breath in and blow into uh, this device. We take three measurements and the best two ones are taken and 10 averages made. Usually this is kept in a diary and it's reversible or improved with an inhaler such as salbutamol. Next we have spirometry, which is where you'll be given this device here. And this is where we get the graphs that I showed you in the beginning of the video. So you take a deep breath in and exhale as, with as much power as you can. And this generates a graph. Generally, now after the inhalers are given, so salbutamol, there is a reversible difference in function. We also have a fractional exhaled NO, which is a diagnostic test uh, which measures the amount of NO that's exhaled. And this is used to give a more accurate diagnostic assessment of asthma. However, it's not necessarily needed for asthma diagnosis because asthma can be diagnosed clinically. We move on to the next part, which is the treatment pathway. Now, what we have with asthma is a very complicated or seemingly complicated stepwise progression. And sometimes this can be quite confusing. So what I'm going to do is try to simplify it for you. So at first we start with a SABA, which is salbutamol. Salbutamol is a short acting beta agonist, so short acting beta agonist. And what that does, it is used acutely to open up the airways and to open up the bronchial. This is the inhaler that's most commonly used by asthmatics when they're having um, some difficulty and provides immediate relief. That's step one. Step two is we add an inhaled corticosteroid. Now with the inhaled corticosteroid, this is a long-term uh, medication, which would be, is given over a long period of time and improves um, the inflammation within the airways. This is to reduce bronchoconstriction symptoms. This is to improve um, the diameter of the lumen of the bronchioles. Then we have step three, and we add either a leukotriene receptor antagonist, which is known as Montelukast, or a long-acting beta agonist such as salmeterol. And the long-acting beta, and these together, or what, or either one of them, help further prevent the remodeling and help keep the airways open. Now, these could be combined, because this is all different inhalers, these can be combined into something called a MART. And a MART is a maintenance and reliever therapy, so maintenance and reliever therapy, which combines inhaled corticosteroids and the LABA. They come in low dose, medium dose, and high dose. And you can also add leukotriene receptor antagonists. Now, in order to improve um, the management, we go from SABA, ICS, we go down the way. But of course, we can also step down treatment. So if the patient has improvements in their symptoms, we can take down their, um, their steroids from high to medium to low. Or we can even take down some of their other inhalers that might not be effective such as leukotriene receptor antagonists. When do we step down? So we consider stepping down every three months. Um, and we also want to step down by 25 to 50% of the dosage for the inhaled corticosteroid component. We also have the annual review of asthma, which is usually conducted in primary care. And that helps us um, understand further um, how to manage how to monitor the progress that the patient is making. Sometimes the patient might be feeling better, sometimes they might be feeling worse. If they're feeling worse, we escalate down the pathway. 
Now you might be asking what happens if we've exhausted all this all the pathways here? Well that's when they get a specialist referral. So moving on to COPD. As we can see on the COPD, it's usually disease of an elderly patient. And the pathophysiology is similar but also different to asthma. The key difference is that it is irreversible damage to the lung. And what happens is we have loss of elasticity and surface area of the alveoli, which is something called emphysema, and we have also increased mucus and narrowing of the airways, which is called bronchitis. It's an inflammatory condition that is triggered usually in smokers and the exposure to tobacco smoke. Of course, there is also happens in non-smokers, which is the anti-trypsin uh, deficiency, alpha-1 anti-trypsin deficiency, which we will talk about a little bit later. As you can see here, we have a collapse of the alveoli, collapsed airway, which means that the effective lung volume is lower. So symptom-wise, it's usually a smoker. They're usually a bit older, more than 45 years old. You'll have a cough, shortness of breath. There may be a wheeze. They might have clubbing. They'll have increased sputum and if it becomes long-term enough, you can have systemic complications such as right heart, strain, and core pulmonale. So we get two phenotypes with COPD, or two, you know, two aspects of the disease. We get the so-called blue bloaters, which are known as the chronic bronchitis. And we get the pink puffers, which is known as emphysema. So chronic bronchitis, which is part of COPD as, a, as the condition, is a clinical diagnosis. And this is diagnosed as daily productive cough for three months or more in at least two consecutive years. These patients are usually overweight and cyanotic. They might have peripheral edema, and they might have bronchi and wheezing on auscultation. Now, in bronchitis, we have inflammation and hyperplasia caused by the tobacco smoke, resulting in hypersecretion of the mucus. And this is due to hypertrophy of the gland. Additionally, the cilia become immotile. So the cilia which move the mucus out of the airways become less mobile. And this is due to this tobacco smoke. We have less cilia moving around, thus the mucus accumulates. And this can be why they have the cough. This triggers the cough reflex, but also can be a source of infection. All of this results in a hypertrophy of mucus glands causing a decreased gland to wall ratio, which limits airflow. We also have small airways becoming obstructed, and the irritants stimulate bronchial constriction. So we have two things. So one is the constriction of the bronchioles due to irritant, and the other is increasing of the thickness. So the lumen decreases by these two mechanisms. Immunologically, we have the CD8 killer T cells, which are found within the bronchial walls, and they contribute to the inflammation. Inflammation leads to scarring, so this is where it becomes different from um, asthma. So it causes scarring, thickening of the walls, which further narrows the airways, and in addition to the bronchial constriction. And this is part of the irreversible damage to the lung. We also get hypoxia uh, because of the impaired gas exchange. And we have hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF, which detects this hypoxia. It stimulates the kidneys to produce more erythropoietin, which stimulates erythropoiesis in the bone marrow, which means more red blood cells are produced, resulting in much higher hemoglobin. This is why we might have raised hemoglobin in these patients. This is known as secondary polycythemia. Now let's move on to the emphysema. So emphysema is a pathological diagnosis, and it result, it's the result of permanent enlargement of air spaces that are distal to the terminal bronchi. The reason for this is an imbalance between protease and antiprotease activity. So if you think of protease, this comes from neutrophil elastase, and protease increases breakdown. So this increased breakdown means that we have um, increased remodeling of the alveoli. 
Then we have anti-protease, which decreases this and helps rebuild it. And it monitors and regulates its activity. Now, in smoking, we have increased oxidative stress, which promotes the breakdown of tissue through protease engagement and causes the alveoli to break down. This causes a smaller surface area for diffusion of gases. Therefore, their airflow and gas exchange is limited. But also, it causes collapses of the small airways. And if enough of these um, alveoli collapse, you form large bullas. And these bulla are areas of gas, areas of lung where no gas exchange occurs. And the alveoli are important for the recoil in breathing in and out, which can cause these pink puffers, making it difficult to take a deep breath in and out. These, pe these patients are usually older and thinner. They're very dyspnea, which means they're very breathless, and they usually ha can have quiet chest sounds. And due to the increase of, sort of dead space in the lungs, these lungs become hyperinflated. See? Hyperinflated. So the diaphragm, which will be usually here, moves down. And with this moving of the diaphragm down, you get this massive uh, view of the lungs on the x-ray. And this further reduces the contact with the pulmonary capillaries and impairs gas exchange. So if we look at causes, so we mentioned smoking is the biggest one, or secondhand smoke. You can also have lung irritants from chemicals, so different occupations. So if they're in the textile industry, if they're in dye industry, it's very important to suss this out. We also have family history. Of COPD, you can also have the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and the way this works is that it stimulates the, um, it causes an imbalance in the protease antiprotease complex by reducing the antiprotease, and therefore the protease uh, dominates, causing the breakdown of the lung. You can also have history of respiratory infections as a child, which causes permanent damage to the lungs as the lungs are developing and resulting in COPD later in life. So investigations are as follows. You can do blood tests, which might show raised hemoglobin, as we discussed, which would be a sign of secondary polycythemia. We can do ABGs, which might show respiratory failure. ECGs will show right heart hypertrophy. This is because there's increased resistance um, of of blood going through the lungs and corporal monale. Spirometry will have the diagnostic FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 0 0.7, which would not be reversible with bronchodilators. And we have a chest x ray, which will show hyperinflation, bullet, and flat diaphragm. And we can visualize the flattening of the diaphragm where this green dotted line is, and that's where we would expect the diaphragm. However, due to the hyperinflation, the diaphragm is moved downwards. So let's talk about management principles. So we have some conservative ones, which include smoking cessation and pulmonary rehab. Pulmonary rehab are a set of exercises which help expectorate the mucus, that's one thing, and help regain function of the lungs. This is very similar to the pulmonary rehabilitation that was done by COP uh, by a coronavirus patient. Next, we have some medication, some interventions. So this involves um, vaccinations. So we give them annual influenza because flu can cause COPD exacerbations. And we give them pneumococcal vaccines because they, we don't want them to have a pneumococcal infection. You can give them a long-term oxygen therapy. You can give them medical therapy, which we'll get into. And we can give them lung reduction surgery. And this might be a little bit uh, counterintuitive. Why do we take out lung tissue? Um, and this is because of the bullet formation. We, can, we have dead space within these areas of the lung, which are having no function. They just limit the patient's ability to breathe effectively, and they cause hyperinflation. Now, these bullet are very thin, so this is just a collection of very large al alveoli. And if that ruptures or that bursts, they might have a pneumothorax. So this would be sort of an end-stage chronic COPD intervention. 
So let's look at the medications. So initially we give them a short-acting beta agonist like an asthma or a short-acting anti-muscarinic agonist or muscarinic agonist. And what this does is it's called titropium and it does a similar function to Saba. That's step one. If step two, we give a short-acting beta agonist with either a long-acting beta agonist such as salmeterol or a long-acting antimuscarinic, which would be uh, titropium, or we give them inhaled corticosteroids. Now, inhaled corticosteroids are given under special circumstances, which we'll go into later. And if neither of these work, we can give something called triple therapy. So Saba, if you can imagine, this can be a lot of inhalers. So Saba will be one inhaler, that's your blue inhaler. But if we give them triple therapy, all of this becomes one inhaler called Trilogy. So you have three inhalers, so three medications and one inhaler. And this is given to the patients who have quite resistant uh, COPD and quite strong COPD. Now, when do we give inhaled corticosteroids instead of LABA or LAMA? It's a good question. So inhaled corticosteroids are given in steroid responsive patients. So what does this mean? So these are patients who have an asthmatic phenotype to the disease. This could either be because they have a previous diagnosis of asthma. This could be because their particular phenotype of airway disease has raised eosinophils, which is what we see in asthma. We could also see a diurnal variation of peak flow. Or we see a variation in the FEV1 um, over time, which is also sort of symptomatic of asthma. So if they have a more asthma or they're potentially steroid responsive, such as they have eczema and they take steroids for that, then that might be given preferentially a step two instead of LABA and LAMA. The next thing I want to move on to is inhale is a at-home oxygen therapy. Now there's some requirements for this to, to begin this therapy at home. And the first one is to stop smoking. Now the reason for this is that if you're smoking and you have an oxygen canister at home, that is an explosive hazard. Because oxygen is highly flammable. That's the one reason for that. And two, second reason for that is if you know if they're if you're giving long-term oxygen, that means that their disease is quite bad. And you want to check good patient compliance by stopping smoking, because that's the thing that's going to help them the most. And if they're not smoking, then they're not going to get that much benefit from this therapy. Second is an oxygen level, which we would get from uh, ABG. So we can either have it if it's less than 7.3 kilopascals, or the oxygen can be 7.3 to 8 kilopascals. However, they need to have the following features. They need to have signs of pulmonary hypertension, which would be on um, signs of pulmonary hypertension on diagnosis from echo or any other intervention they might have. Um, there might be secondary polycythemia, which we would confirm with full blood count, or there's peripheral edema, which would be said of right heart failure. So these are the sort of three conditions for giving long-term oxygen therapy. And the long-term oxygen therapy has a significant effect on mortality and otherwise outcome. So let's summarize this. So we have asthma versus COPD. So in asthma, the average age would be quite younger, whereas in COPD, this is older patients. There will be history of atopy, so this could be nasal polyps, eczema, allergies, whereas in COPD it'll be smoking history. Generally there's cough, wheeze, and tightness, asthma, whereas tightness is not necessarily a feature of COPD, it may happen, but you have a cough and breathlessness. Asthma is usually episodic, so they might have no symptoms between exacerbations, whereas COPD they might be having symptoms such as decreased ability to walk a certain distance, finger clubbing, uh, breathlessness, and they're usually quite worse off in that they might have other comorbidities. Asthma is generally re like it's reversible with a bronchodilator, whereas COPD is not always reversible, and usually it is irreversible due to the irreversible damage caused to the lungs. The final slides are going to focus on acute exacerbations. So we're going to start with acute asthma. 
So acute asthma is stratified into three different categories. We have the mild, moderate, severe, and life threatening. And the reason for the stratification is that there's different treatment algorithms and different priorities depending on the level of asthma. And it's very important to recognize to get the correct treatment for that. So the parameters that we watch out for is peak expiratory flow and SpO2, respiratory rate, and heart rate. If the oxygen saturations are above 92 and the peak expiratory flow is above 50, it's usually mild or moderate acute asthma. In children, if there's heart rate is, if their respiratory rate is um, up to 30, that's considered mild, and if they're under 5, up to 40, that's considered mild or moderate. There's minimal use of accessory muscles, which would be, if you can imagine this, putting your hands on your knees and leaning forward, and doing a sort of tripod position to get a better breathing, better engagement of the accessory muscles, so your abdominals and your neck muscles. A child might be feeding well. And they will be talking in full sentences for adults. And there may be a wheeze, but it would be only audible with a stethoscope. Otherwise, you wouldn't hear a wheeze. We move on to severe. So severe is our oxygen saturation is less than 92. However, the key difference here is the peak expiratory flow rate, which is 33 to 50 percent of predicted, whereas life-threatening is less than 33. In the respiratory rate, we would see that it's much greater, so they're breathing heavily. So it would be generally over 30 if the child was 5, or patients and adults. And under 5 years old, it would be over 40 breaths per minute. Um, in children, they might be too breathless to feed, babies as well. And in adults, they might be too breathless to talk, so they will be not, not able to complete full sentence. They will be tachycardic, so it will be usually under, over 120 or, or 125 for under five year, over 5-year-olds. And over 140 for under five year old, year old people. But then we have accessory muscle use, so trap position, and we will have an audible wheeze. So you'll have a clear sounding wheeze that you do not hear through a stethoscope. It will be loud and it will be audible. That would indicate a severe reaction. Then we have life threatening. And the way to remember this is with an acronym called 3392 CHEST. Peak expiratory flow is less than 33. O2 saturations are less than 92. We have cyanosis, confusion, and, loss, and changes in consciousness. That's what we see. We have um, hypotension, loss of blood pressure for H. We have exhaustion and poor effort for E. S, we have a silent chest. And T is tachycardia. And this needs immediate treatment. And you might be watching out for um, need to escalate this to HD, so high dependence unit or ICU. So if we look at the different treatments, what we want to start with is basically resus. So we give them oxygen um, at full 15 liters. We give them nebulizers. So this is an aerosolized version of these drugs. So this is salbutamol infotropium, or we'll get inhaler form, but it's nebulized. And you put it on an oxygen mask and they get it straight into the lungs. And this is salbutamol 5 milligrams and apotropin bromide 0.5 milligrams. For children, these doses are a little lower. Next, we give medications. So we want to give corticosteroids. And that's because we want to bring down the inflammation. So as we said with the pathophysiology of asthma, we have bronchoconstriction and we have inflammation. The bronchoconstriction is relieved by salbutamol and apotropin bromide. And the corticosteroids, either oral or IV, reduce the inflammation. Now, if we're getting a poor response, we escalate this further. So we would give IV magnesium sulfate, IV salbutamol, and IV aminophilin. Now, these drugs are, you know, if you're giving these drugs, that means that the patient is not responding well. And you, they might be a candidate for ventilation. And therefore, they need to be admitted potentially to ICU or HD. Now, what's the difference between HTU and ICU and a ward? It's to do with the number of nurses per patient. So in an ICU, you might have one nurse per one patient. In HTU, might be two nurses per patient. But compare that to a ward, you might have one nurse sometimes to eight or ten patients. And the level of care they can get 
and the level of monitoring is much greater in this ICU and HDU. And you want to monitor this because the, the parameters can change very rapidly and you need to be given immediate response. Plus these doctors here and staff here in ICU and HDU are well trained, have a lot of experience with acute asthma and all these patients. So they see them, that's their sort of day to day. So you want to be in a in the environment where this is their day to day and they know how to manage this successfully. That's for acute asthma. So acute COPD. So acute COPD is generally older patients. Um, and the causes are usually an, it is an infection on top of the COPD. Whereas in asthma, it is more of an acute exacerbation caused by an allergen. So bacterial causes most commonly is Haemophilus influenza. And we have Streptococcus pneumonia, Moraxilla catarrhalis, and Pseudomonas. Earlier we talked about the Streptococcus and, uh, vaccinations, and that's to prevent Streptococcus pneumonia. Pseudomonas species are usually quite resistant to antibiotics and um, are common in patients who have either other comorbidities or very serious COPD. Next we have viral. So viral causes include rhinovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, the flu, so power influenza and influenza, and coronaviruses. So treatment. So the treatment is very similar to asthma. We give them oxygen. Initially, we give them 15 liters of oxygen. However, once they're stabilized, once their blood pressure and everything's under control, we want to bring this down so that their saturations are 88 to 92%. Now, why is this? Well, this is because people with COPD, they retain carbon dioxide. And this is because the gas exchange in the lungs, as we mentioned before, is not very good. And so we do not want to give them too much oxygen because then otherwise they will not have enough carbon dioxide. They will just breathe it in and out. And they will not be able to have the respiratory drive um, that patients who do not, have, do not have chronic retention. So in that case, we want to make it 88 to 92% so that these patients um, have the correct respiratory drive. In the acute setting, it doesn't matter. We want to give them 50 liters of oxygen. However, we, don't want to, we do not want them to be on this for a long period of time. Nebulizer-wise, it is much the same. We give them salbutamol, 5 milligrams, ipotropium bromide, open up those airways. Medications wise, we also give um, steroids, generally oral steroids, and that's 30 milligrams. We also give antibiotics. Um, however, antibiotics should only be reserved if there's evidence of a pneumonia. So this would involve purulent sputum, which means pus in the sputum, presence of a fever, or consolidation on chest x ray. And the antibiotics we give is amoxicillin. If they're allergic to penicillins, we give them clarithromycin or doxycycline. Once again, if they get a poor response, what do we do? Well, with poor response, we give them non-invasive ventilation, which is BiPAP. We give them IV aminophilin. And as always, we want to escalate to ICU and HD so that they get the proper ventilation, and proper care. These patients are generally older, so we also need to consider ceilings of care and advanced directives maybe even do not resuscitate um, orders and for that we need to have, we generally know the plan but it's always important to ask the patient or the patient's relatives when they first come in so that we have a good plan and so that we know what parameters we are treating okay i hope that was helpful airway disease is very similar with the asthma and copd however there are some key differences and um, we went over the acute asthma, we went over acute COPD, we went briefly over the pathophysiology and how we manage these in a sort of long-term treatment and in the acute setting. And I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them.